right, well, good morning. This is our morning devotion. It's episode 77. I apologize for yesterday. I did leave a note, but uh, my my cord that plugs into my computer got joggled, jiggled, and it wasn't charging. So I got through 15 minutes, and, my, and all of a sudden everything just goes blank because my battery's dead. So sorry about that. But uh, for those that wanted a little shorter devotions, everybody's cheering, you know, because preachers, they just could go on and on. <laughs> So uh, I think I got it resolved. I mean, it was just more careful. So I don't think that's going to happen again. But we're in Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is a very familiar portion of Scripture. And I included verses 4 through 15 uh, in this, which is, uh, especially if you're in the homeschool movement or Christian school movement, everybody's very familiar with this passage of Scripture. And it has to do with the transfer of the truth across generations and the danger of not transferring that truth in time to come because if anyone ever forgets uh, then they and drift back into idolatry, then the, the verses that follow just speak of the way that God's going to respond to that. He's going to do to Israel what he's done to the nations that right now, or in just a moment here, Joseph, or Joshua is going to drive out. So it is. Uh, this is something that's very, very important. I cannot overemphasize this. What we're talking about in this chapter, and I mean, it's the Word of God. Everything is the Word of God. But what this is saying to us must be heeded. <clears throat> this is not negotiable. It's not one of those things. This is this is one of those mountains, not a molehill. Let's say it that way in the Scripture, that we have to stand on and fight for and never give up. And so let me just uh, look at the passage that we uh, considered here. And this has to deal, I entitled this, I mean, I sound really Baptisty here because I got this. I got this crazy title with all the T's: the importance of thorough transgenerational truth transference. <laughs> Isn't that horrible? the um, The importance of thorough transgenerational across generations truth, the content of God's word, transference, the transfer to the next generation. That's what this whole chapter or these verses are about. So let's just start here in. Deuteronomy 6, 4, this is what we know as the Shema. And Shema is just the Hebrew for hear. Isn't that interesting? And this is uh, when you have the morning and evening prayers uh, for the, in the uh, Jewish culture uh, as, they, as they worship. It begins with the Shema. Uh, it says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's what, it's, that's what this is all about. Uh, so Shema, we call it the Shema, but it just means uh, hear, hear, O Israel. And so when it says hear, O Israel, the word hear in the Hebrew is Shema, O Israel, and here is the way the prayers begin. Now, the, there's all kinds of prayers, but this is how they all begin. Hear, O Israel, Shema, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And it just emphasizes the fact that there's only one God and there is only one God. It's one God in three persons. We understand it more thoroughly in the Trinity as it's described in the New Testament. Uh, but there is only one God. But it is God is not one God like an absolutely one God, like a, a monistic God like uh, Allah. Allah is monistic. He is, he is a, a one absolute God, one God. And uh, then you ha and if that's true, you have all kinds of questions. Like if he's truly God and, there's a, and he's a monistic, and, and he's just in himself, God, then how does he communicate to anybody? Because God is holy, other, transcends us. How did he ever say anything to any angels or Muhammad or anybody? Because you have to have some way of communicating if you're absolutely God. This is fun, a fundamental error that Muhammad didn't wor get worked out when he wrote the Quran. All right, uh, that, that's a problem. Because God, to, to communicate, has to some way... Uh, have a mediator, which is the Son of God, right, to communicate and reveal the Father to us. I mean, the the, the God of Christianity, the God of the Bible. This this is something that this is why other religions come to Christianity because if they really think about it, their religion is is rationally unstable. It just doesn't work. If you would just be honest, the only God there can be is the God of the Bible. There is one God. One God, only one God, and that's what this says, Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our, our uh, God is one Lord, but he reveals himself, or he's in three persons. All right, now I shouldn't say reveal himself. He's, he is in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
right? It is the triunity, all right, of God. So we see God ontologically as one, economically as the way that he works in creation and reveals himself uh, as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That, of course, is the wonder of Christianity, all right? So, but here we're emphasizing the oneness. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then it says this, verse 5, And thou shalt love uh, the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might, which is the next thing. You see, that sounds much more like the New Testament than it does the law, doesn't it? This God you are to love. Now, which would, and I only have a few minutes in these devotions, but just consider that. Why then are you faithful in, in doing what he says in the law? Why? Because you're mandated to? Because of the crushing ramifications of, of uh, what happens to you if you don't do it, that you're living under the threat of this angry God that's standing over you? No, that's not, that's not the, the theme or the tenor, even in the Old Testament, no matter how it's preached or portrayed. The whole idea here is, is you have one God, and it, the whole idea then is to love him, love him, which is the same thing we have, for God so loved the world. And as long as I've said that, ask yourself, because this is a great question, is John 3.16 in the Old Testament or in the New Testament? I know where it is on the side of that little white piece of paper between Malachi and Matthew, but how much of what's on the right side of that white sheet of paper between Malachi and Matthew transpired in the Old Testament? Just think about it for a minute. All of the Gospels, except for the last chapter or two, which deals with the resurrection of Christ, all of that is in the Old Testament. Christ lived in the Old Testament. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets, which makes John 3.16 an Old Testament verse. You see, John 3.16, I could, I could uh, parallel with this when it says, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. You know, all, all of this. This is, this is what we as saints in the New Testament are to do. All right? God loves us. We love him. We love him because he first loved us. That's, that's the content of uh, 1 John. And then it says this, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. This is to be internalized. This is not external. This is all very new covenant language, isn't it? This isn't something that you carry on the outside like a Bible under your arm. No. He says, you're supposed to put this inside you. This is supposed to be inculcated in you. You're supposed to make this a part of you. See, and I, I believe that's what's true of all the Bible, but here it's expressly stated. Our goal as Christians is to internalize and become as much an epistle, as Paul says in the, to the Colossians. We are to become an epistle ourselves as we internalize the Word of God. As we memorize it and as we practice it, we should be walking, talking scriptures. That's, that's what we're about, and this is what this is. He says, and these words... These words of God that are here in the book of Deuteronomy, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. Put it inside you. Make it part of your own. Make it your own. Make it the, the warp and woof of your person. And that is what we're supposed to do with all the scripture. That is the way we are to live our lives as Christians. Every time I say study to show thyself approved unto God, all it means is we're fallen and we're under the curse. That's all it means because now we have to read, learn, listen, study because we can't get it in our heads. Because the way it was meant for us to be is for to have all of this inside of us. I said the other day, I wrote something the other day. What, did Adam carry a Bible around? Do you have a Bible that he had to carry around? No. No, because he was in the image of God without the curse. We have scriptures now, and everything we're doing now is because of the curse that we have to fight through. Because our brains can't manage it. We need help, which is the word of God. But he says, put this inside you. He says, uh, and thou shalt teach them diligently. Here it is. Not just teach them. When it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he shall not depart from it. And I hear people talk about that all the time. Like, they skip over what training is. My dad used to talk about training. And let me say, to be trained in anything is arduous, hard. People don't do what they do because you have to be trained, right? Olympic athletes are trained, and it is tough. Whatever you're doing it, 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 in, our, in our armed services, these, these soldiers are trained, and it's tough. I mean, if you want to get strong, you have to go to the gym or a, a professional athlete, and you train, and it is hard. That's what it is. This says, it, when it says train up a child, it does, just, does not mean like 
pat him on the head and say, God bless you and send him out the door. That's not what this is. This is training. <laughs> Train up a child in the way he should go. And that's what this is. He says, and thou shalt teach them diligently. I mean, get after it. Diligently unto thy children. And here we go. You want to know what diligently looks like. And thou shalt talk with them when they sit in the house. That is, it's the conversation around the house. We're going to talk about God, and we're going to talk about how he works, and we're going to talk about how he answers prayer. And this is my, my son, and, and really in the Van Cleek family, we love to tell stories because we rehearse the goodness and grace of God. It's good to do that. If you, if you know where God has blessed you or preserved you, which he has for all of us, then we, are to, we should relay this. This should just be part of our common conversation, our discourse around the house as we're talking with our kids. All right? It says, and to do this, this is the way we live our lives. He says, so uh, uh, talk with them when thou sittest in thine house. Uh, that is when you're sitting down, when thou walkest by the way, when you're on the path, you talk about how beautiful what God is, and you tell your kids about what you learned. I mean, I did this all the time, uh, especially when I was in school. When you're in seminary, I was able to pass on the things that I had been thinking in, 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 uh, to my sons, which and my daughter, which gave them a leg up <laughs> because they grew up in the home of a seminarian who came home and tell them what they were learning. And my boys, uh, and not everybody does that, but my boys had, a, I think, an advantage because of that. But it's true of all of us, whether you're an engineer or military or whether or not you're, you, you, no matter what you do, uh, what, we, what we are to do is learn the Bible well enough where we can talk about it when we're with our families. That's all this is and to do it diligently, because they need to hear it. He says that when thou sittest in thy house, when they walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Do it in the morning, do it at night. There you go. He's saying your whole life should be in a sphere, should be like in a fishbowl of training your kids and tell them what the Word of God is, that, that this is a Christ-centered home. All right, this is what this is all about. This, this doesn't mean you have to, you know, you're, you're preaching, this is like when you're out throwing the ball with your with your grand grandkids, or you're throwing the ball with your son, or you go to the football game and and you're just enjoying life together, and you and, and they know, and your son looks at you while you're at a sporting event and says, "My dad is a great guy. I mean, he teaches me the Bible, and look, we're having this much fun. I mean, this Christianity stuff is pretty good because you can be a Christian and still enjoy life. He still laughs, mom still laughs, mom and dad still laugh. This Christianity stuff because when it comes down to the scriptures. They're really serious about it, but hey, life is here to live and let's live it, right? Yeah, this I think I have a bunch of, of, of brothers in Christ that are out there that somehow think that that if you're a Christian, the worst thing that could happen to you is to get a smile on your face, you know, because hey, things are serious out there. And I am not saying things are not serious. You know me, anybody that knows me, I know, you know things are, are serious and the things that I say here are serious. But when you're raising your kids, they need to know the delight and joy and beauty of the Lord. Not just that if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. No, that's true. But they need to know it all, especially in the context of the home, because there's going to be no greater teacher, especially to young men, than the dad. That's just the way it is. They admire the dad. They might not always understand him, and sometimes they might even fear him because mom will say, wait till your dad gets home, which is not a bad thing. That's respect. That's due respect to your dad. That's not a bad thing because it's not fearful. It's fearful because you know you've done wrong, and he's the one that takes care of that, keeps control in the house, makes sure there's peace in the house, right? Okay. So he says you just put this within the sphere of teaching the word of God. He says, it says, it says, thou shalt bind them by a sign upon thy hand. They shall be as front ones between the eyes. Now, we don't do that because they used to strap a piece of scripture right here on their arm, which is called uh, a phylactery, and then a, and a frontlet. They put it right here between their eyes. So whenever wherever they go, the word of God was before them. It's that idea in the New Testament church. We don't do that. The Bible doesn't say we have to do that. But the idea is to keep the scriptures before them, all right? Keep, the, keep it before them. It says, thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. And that just is our property is also part of this. The reason we have our property is because of God. And wherever they go, they go in the gate. They see it when they when they see the post uh, of, or the lintel of their house. They see it. Uh, this is why, in, in, not, and it doesn't say this in the Bible, but this is why in a lot of homes, Christian homes, there's verses on the wall. I grew up in a house with verses on the wall. I have verses on the wall here. Uh, so you look around the house and you can read a verse of scripture. It's not exactly the same. We're not an Israeli home, but the principle is the same that, that wherever you look, 
you have scripture. There's a Bible out. That's dad's Bible. Or if it's in his study, all right, that's dad's Bible, all right? Uh, or there's a Bible that you just have out near the table. It might not be your big Bible or your study Bible that you work on when you're preparing things, but it's out by the table. And you just tell one of your boys to reach over there on the counter and go grab it. So during devotion time, for bre at breakfast time or, or whenever you do it or in the evening, you can just grab that Bible and work through it. All right? Things like that. Um, but the whole idea is the, the home is permeated with the presence of God through the teaching of Scripture. That's what we're talking about. He goes on. And, and then he says this, verse 10. He says, um, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which swear, he swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. I haven't said much about that, but you know when they go in the promised land, they don't have to, they don't have to build anything. <laughs> they don't have to plant. We're going to see. They don't have to build houses because there's houses there. Uh, they don't have to plant vineyards because the vineyards are always there. They don't have to plant orchards because there's orchards there. They don't have to plant grain in the field because it's already there. It's like moving into a fully furnished nation, <laughs> a fully, fully furnished promised land. It's not one where you have to go in and still buy, you know, your washer and dryer and your stove and your refrigerator because it's already there. When you occupy the land, it's already there. And so this victory is going to be mean immediate. Listen to this. Following God in this is going to mean immediate security and wealth to the Israeli nation. They have not been living in houses. They have been living in tents for 40 years in the wilderness. And they are going to go into a lush, green, growing, beautiful promised land. If they'll just obey God, it's all going to be theirs. It's just move in. <laughs> It's, it's a marvelous picture. And I, I talked to my mom and when we were talking about Moses not going in, but it's true. Moses had been in the desert for 40 years, and when he get, went up on Mount Nebo and he looks over, and uh, or Pisgah, and he uh, sees all the promised land, what does he see? He sees green, lush ground. This is what God gives him a vision of before he passes away. All right, let's keep going. So you go in. Oh, yeah, you don't, even, you don't have to... Uh, uh, oh, verse 11, the house is full of all good things. That is, the cupboards are full, too. It's all furnished. <laughs> oh, man. And thou fillest, uh, that thou fillest not, and wells dig that thou diggest not. You didn't have to bring your own furniture, and you don't have to go dig a well. And we don't think about that because we have well, driggers in Amer well diggers in America that come in with these big rigs and will drive that pipe until they find water for 250 feet or however long it is. until And they put a pipe at the end of the pipe, and they pump water out of that deep spring that's down in the earth. And uh, it costs you something to get that done, but we don't have to dig it. No. These folks dug wells. What do you think that was like? How much energy did that take? How hard was that? Looking for water. See, he says, you're not going to have to do that. The thing you need most for your crops and for your family and for your animals is water. And the water is going to be right there because you don't have to dig the well. It's already there. Just drop the bucket. <laughs> it's amazing what God is saying here. He says, wells that thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. I mean, it's, and he mentions vineyards and olive trees because this is where you get wine and, and olive oil, which are the expensive things. All right, these are the things to demonstrate, when it says, the Bible says in Revelation, hurt not the oil and the wine, that's because those are the things that rich people have. And he's saying, these things that rich people have, you're going to have, and I'm just going to lay it on your plate for you once you occupy the land. Isn't that amazing? These are luxury items, oil and wine. And it says here, vineyards and olive trees. It goes on. Then, he says, and then I got to get going here, it says this, then beware lest thou forget the Lord. Why? Because you start focusing on the blessing rather than the one that's blessed you. We do this. Don't do that. Remember that what you have is from God. And don't focus on the blessing, what he's done for you, but remember the one who has granted this to you, given this to you, and you did not do anything for it. And, uh, I mean, it's clear. Uh, you didn't do anything for your salvation. It's just the grace of God. And we should always be thankful. We had did nothing for it. God gave it to us. It's, it was the grace of God. Right? He reached down and saved us. Don't forget that we got something free and then and then work contrary to it, that is, fall into sin. That's what he's saying. He says, appreciate, love the one that granted you these wonderful blessings. He goes on. 
Beware lest thou forget the Lord, because that's what happens. Forgetting, forgetting, forgiving. Remember I said people say, well, I don't need to. No, we forget. Say it again. I don't want to do that again, 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 again. You're going to forget. Don't forget. Don't forget the Lord that brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, that thou fear the Lord thy God and serve him, and thou shalt swear by his name. You shall not go after other gods of the, pe uh, gods of the people which are round about you. Don't fall into idolatry. Don't substitute the God that's blessed you with another God. Transgenerational truth. No weak links. This is a hard one because this is a hard one. So if you're a young person out there and you're not married yet or you're just married and you're starting to raise a family, don't look at the old people around you. You can look at some, but don't look at all. And don't say it can't be done because I've not. I, maybe you haven't seen too much of that. And maybe it didn't happen to you in your home. This is where you break into that vicious cycle and start doing it right. Don't worry about the ones that are grandpas and grandmas and whether they did it for their kids and what happened to their kids and look what's happened. That's, that's not your business. That is not your business. Your business is your home, your home, your wife and your kids. And you can start this and you can break into this vicious cycle and you can start doing what this says. So your home, your home will, will practice this. You practice this. And even when that happens, the devil's out there. You need to do it diligently, all right? Anchor your kids in the word. And, and they're your kids, all right? The, uh, God's granted you and your wife, those kids, all right? Those are your kids. They are a heritage of the Lord. They're the fruit of the womb. It's his reward. They're your kids. And uh, and start the, the whatever your name is, seminary. And mom, that's when you pour it on. That's when you teach like like you're at you're a Westminster prof. Yeah, that's when you dive in. That's when you take everything you've ever learned and you start pouring it into those kids, right? Because there'll come a time where you won't be able to. They're going to leave the house. But while they're home, pour yourself into them. Same thing with you, Dad. Pour yourself into them. Because for all those of us that have had kids and graduated and went to college, there is a heartache that you feel when they're gone, all right? When they leave, because that time, that limited time that you have to do what the Bible says is behind you. Teach your children diligently. <laughs> All right. I went a little long. Lord bless you. You have a great day. All right. And do you see? My battery was up. I made it all the way through. <laughs> all right. Lord bless you. Yeah. And uh, tomorrow's Friday. I'm heading up north to see my son and his family. Um, We'll have to see if I could do this, all right? So if I don't have a devotion tomorrow, you'll understand why, but I'll do my best to get one up, all right?